Washington Post was first to report that President Donald Trump pressured Georgia's top election official to find enough votes to overturn his losses in that state, raising legal and ethical questions for a president already in, uh, uh, who had already faced impeachment by the U.S. Congress. Now, the uh, Post uh, obtained an audio recording of the Saturday telephone call between uh, Trump and Georgia's Republican Secretary of State to Brad Raffsenberger, and in which uh, the outgoing president uh, Trump flattered, uh, begged, and threatened Raffsenberger uh, with uh, unsubstantiated criminal consequences where the uh, Georgia election, if it's not overturned. All I want to do is this I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more that we have, because we won the state. And honestly, this should go very fast. You should meet tomorrow, because you have a big election, election coming up. And because of what you've done to the president, you know, the people of, of uh, Georgia know that this was a scam. And because of what you've done to the president, a lot of people aren't going out to vote. John Lebutelier is a former Republican member of uh, the U.S. House of Representatives, and he joins us now via Skype for more. Uh, John, always good to talk to you. Thanks so much indeed for joining us. Um, I am sure, I know you're a Republican, but you must be gobsmacked when you heard that uh, conversation. Well, Happy New Year, Peter. Great <laughs> to talk to you. I haven't talked to you since last year. <laughs> I think it was last week, actually. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, uh, well, I'm not totally gobsmacked anymore after four years of this type of thing from Trump and, and an accelerated pace of it since November 3rd. We, we, we can hear in that voice on that phone call from Saturday the desperation of Donald Trump. He, for some reason, he just can't accept that he lost the election, which he did lost by a lot, actually, and he can't handle it. Uh, it shows something's wrong with him. Every other elected official, including myself, who loses an election, you don't like it, but you get up and you go on, and he can't do it. And uh, we've got 15 and a half days left mm. till he's out, and it's going to be a wild ride, I'm afraid. I mean, listening to the tape, people are calling it an abuse of power, and even possibly breaking laws. Uh, just how serious is what happened in that conversation? Well, I am not a lawyer, but reading everything since yesterday when the tape was made public, you have election law experts in both Georgia and Washington, D.C., who say that Trump may very well have violated state election law in Georgia and federal election law and other federal laws, including extortion, uh, on that phone call. Now, whether they're going to do anything about it, prosecute them, I don't know. Congress could initiate impeachment all over again, but as of today, they've indicated they're not interested. You know, if he had a year or two left in office, they may do it, but he's only got two weeks left. So what's the point, really, uh, uh, from Congress's point of view? Legally, they can take their time in either Georgia or Washington and decide whether they want to prosecute him. And the real reason they would do it, I think, is there needs to be a precedent that a president can't do this and get away with it. Because after Trump is gone, there may be another Trump someday, another, you know, megalomaniac president who uses his or her powers to try to stay in office even when they've lost an election. And that's got to be stopped now if we can stop it. All right, so uh, a lot hinges tomorrow on an election for uh, new senators, two up for grabs in the state of Georgia, um, and people are wondering if he hasn't muddied the waters with his behavior. Uh, well, we're going to find out. These are two crucial races that begin tomorrow, go all day and night. Uh, we'll, as you said, determine control of the United States Senate. 
Trump is going down there in four hours from now. Biden is there today campaigning because it's that crucial over who runs the Senate. And this can't help the Republicans in Georgia. This divides Republicans against each other. No one knows what Trump is going to say at the last minute on the stump in Dalton, Georgia tonight. So far, we know three million people in Georgia have voted in this special election by early voting and mail-in voting, the highest turnout ever for a runoff. And it's disproportionately people of color and young people and voters in areas that vote more Democrat than Republican. So it could be that Trump has screwed this thing up and handed these two Senate seats that are held by Republicans, he may be handing them through his behavior over to the mm. Democrats. We will know Wednesday, Thursday, somewhere in there. Both the Republican um, candidates uh, for these uh, races had to gamble, I guess, as well on do they bring in Trump? Do they distance themselves um, ahead of this race? And it seems as if they've tried to get as close as they can without completely embracing him? I, I think they've completely embraced him, really? I have to say. I think they have. I think most Republicans have no choice but to embrace Trump, because what you're embracing is the Trump base, this massive amount of rural white vote that loves Trump. And as I had just said, the black vote, the young vote, the suburban vote that voted for Biden in November has already voted again in these special elections. And the assumption is they're voting for the two Democrats. And in order to have a chance, these Republicans had to bring Trump back in tonight and have him juice up the Republican vote for tomorrow and have them come out and vote. So far, they're not voting in as high numbers as they did in the presidential race. So tonight's their last chance to juice them up and vote tomorrow. And the um, Democrats would love a win because to control the House and the Senate pretty much guarantees you all your legislation. Well, it's a huge thing because the way it works in our system, Peter, in the U.S. Senate, the majority leader decides everything that happens in the Senate, not, not the outcome, but which issues get dealt with, which things are brought to the floor of the Senate to be looked at, and which things therefore stay out of the Senate. And Mitch McConnell is very clever about how he uses that power. First thing up for um, Biden is the confirmation of all the members of his cabinet. And if the Democrats control the Senate, there's no doubt he'll get everybody he wants through the Senate. If the Republicans control it, he's going to have to fight on every mm. single appointee. And, and that's either going to be McConnell, if the Democrats lose tomorrow, or Charles Schumer, the senator from uh, New York, who will be the, he's the Democratic leader. If he is the majority leader after tomorrow night, it'll be a whole different mm. Senate uh, to go with the Democratic House and a Democratic president. And Biden can go and do a lot of things quickly on COVID, on global warming, on taxes, on immigration, a lot of things. Fifteen and a half days still to go, as you were saying. Uh, I've even seen some articles where people saying that uh, uh, he should resign straight away. Uh, it is interesting to see a development with all 10 living former defense secretaries writing this uh, letter to make sure that the military is not involved. I mean, you know, could we, is there strong suggestion that Donald Trump wants to involve the military in trying to stay president? We don't know what caused a former vice president and former defense secretary Dick Cheney to initiate that letter. It was his idea. He wrote the letter. He got nine other former secretaries of defense to sign it with him, both Democrat and Republican. They must have heard something 
that Trump was thinking about doing. Now, since the election, Trump fired the Secretary of Defense, Mark Esper, who's one of the ones who signed that letter, and he's put in a bunch of second-rate hacks over in the Pentagon, civilians. And it's been rumored that if push comes to shove, Trump may do something with the military to try to stay in office. Martial law, which we don't have in this country, but he's talked about it. And I think this letter from Cheney and the other secretaries of defense is a shot across the bow to the uniform military, which says to them, uh, do not follow an illegal order. You are not to be involved in the election or what happens after the election. Leave it alone. And we'll see what's going to happen. I, I think these next 15 plus days are dicey times in the United States. Correct me if I'm wrong. Congress still has to ratify the Electoral College votes, right? And I believe that there is still some Republicans who might vote against what the people have desired for their country. Right. So on Wednesday, what happens is there's a joint session of the House and Senate in the morning on Wednesday with the Vice President Pence uh, presiding over it. They bring in a box all the envelopes from each state with all the electoral votes. He opens them and they count the electoral votes. We already know it's 306 for Trump, 232 for Biden. But it does say in the Constitution that the House and Senate uh, have to vote to accept it, but they can protest an individual state and the results therein if uh, someone from the House and someone from the Senate both agree to protest it. And we already know 140 Republicans in the House and at least 12 Republican senators in the Senate have said they're going to protest Pennsylvania and five other states. We also know that the majority in both the House and Senate have already said they're voting to accept Joe Biden's victory. So this is really a sideshow for some publicity hounds in the House and Senate to get on TV and scream like Trump about voter fraud when there is no evidence of voter fraud. But why would they vote in this way? I mean, you know, is it not embarrassing? Um, and uh, will there be no consequences for them going forward? Trump will be gone in 15 days, 16 days, and they have to carry on and face voters and face the public. Well, I think the ones in the Senate, several of them, have their eyes on running for president in 2024. They want those Trump voters who are a majority of voters in the Republican Party and, uh, and who vote in primaries, for instance, and they, they want to replace Trump as the leader of the current Republican Party. It makes me gag to say it, because Donald Trump is not a Republican, but he's been a Republican for the sake of this presidency. And so Josh Hawley, Ted Cruz, people like that, they're running for president in four years, and they think they can get a leg up by following Trump right now and saying, oh, massive voter fraud, I'm going to stop the thing in the Senate, blah, blah. They're going to lose. It has split the Republicans. Normally, the Republicans in the Senate are a united caucus. They stay together pretty well. This thing has split them, and it's going to be about 40 of them vote for Biden to be accepted, and 10 or 12 don't. And we got to watch how that plays out over the next year or two. So one of the legacies of the Donald Trump era will be he's leaving behind a fractured Republican Party. Peter, there was a, there's a guy here who runs the Lincoln Project, which you've probably heard about, and named Rick Wilson. And he wrote a book four years ago at the best title to describe the whole thing. Title of the book is everything Trump touches dies. And that is really true. And you just go through these four years and things that Trump has put his hands on and gotten involved in. He's killed everything. 
And the last victim may, I hope it's not going to be America. I think the last victim is going to be the Republican Party. I'm not sure we, and I'm still a member of it, I'm not sure we as a party can survive the legacy of Donald Trump. We may have to have a new party that does not include him or his ilk. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens uh, after the 20th uh, of uh, January. Will Trump still be influential or will he start to disappear? Because part of his whole thing is the media and how he uh, plays out in the media. If that oxygen is taken away, does he disappear too? Well, he's going to disappear some, because as president, whenever he tweets something or says something on the way to the helicopter or at the golf course or whatever, it's news, because it's from the president. We're going to have a new president. What he says will be the news. Trump will be wherever he's going to live, Florida. And he's not going to be on the news every day. And after a while, I think he'll get very unhappy with that. So he'll start tweeting even crazier stuff. And whether the media continues to cover that, I, I wonder. Mm. And he, the one that's been you know, giving him oxygen for five years, really, is Fox. And I think after January 20th, they're going to push Trump away from them and move on to be in opposition to Biden, but much less time spent on Donald Trump and the crazy stuff he says every day. All right. John Le Boutelier, always a pleasure talking to you. Thanks so much indeed for joining us. Let's see what happens tomorrow. It could be a game changer. Thanks so much indeed for your insights. Thanks, Peter. Talk to you soon. This year. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> All right. That's uh, John uh, Le Boutelier, a former uh, U.S. Uh, congressman uh, of the Republican Party. He's still a member of that party. And uh, like many other Republicans, uh, a little bit shocked by some of the things that Donald Trump has done and continues to do, uh, particularly with just 15 and a half days left in office. We'll have more for you after this.